A place called home for all God's sons and daughters, where hope can find a human habitation. Good evening. My name is Melissa Borgman Kemdi, and I'm grateful to be here for this evening to pray together and reflect on this theme of home and hope. I begin by simply claiming the Presentation Chapel as home. Since I first set foot in here in 2001 for a CSJ Consociates blessing, I've always known a warmth and a welcome in this space. I'm grateful to Sister Mary Hasbrook, wherever she was. She was there the last time. There she is, she's still there. For extending the invitation to speak in this space alongside Makwe and Bonnie. After sharing a music book and a mic stand with Sister Mary for 10 years, singing in the choir at the former Church of St. Philip's in North Minneapolis, it does my heart good to come and sing with her and all of you in this location. I bring with me that experience of prayer, the community in and around 26th and Bryant on the north side, those songs and lift our expanded sense of home here tonight. What do I call home? And what has disrupted my experience of home? How have I known violence? How do I see hope finding human habitation? These are the questions I'm using to inform my reflection tonight. As a homeowner on Selby Avenue in the Lexham neighborhood of St. Paul, there is a literal physical being I call home. As a former English teacher and a spiritual director, I know a more expansive definition of that word that encompasses the metaphoric aspects of dwelling, heart, safe walls, community. I claim my husband, Francois, and our daughters, Marguerite and Gabby, and our son in heaven, Javi, as home. And I include my spiritual and educational communities at Nativity of Our Lord, just up the street, and the school there, the Church of Ascension in North Minneapolis as home. I call the living room and chapel of the Visitation Sisters in Minneapolis on the north side another harbor for my heart, my mind, and my spirit. Home. As the setting in which I practice my calling as a spiritual director and amongst the community of fellow listeners to sacred stories, I claim the Loyola Spirituality Center in the Rondo neighborhood as a home. As a white woman conscious of place and power and privilege, I also claim the historic roots of that building as part of my home, recognizing it was once a monastery for black Catholic nuns. I claim the boat that, the Germ that my German ancestors set off from in a harbor outside of Heron, Germany, home, the open fields around my childhood dwelling along rural Route 1 in Norfolk, Nebraska, that rounds out my list, and perhaps most recently, comprising the most hours of my waking at this time, I call PJ Murphy's Bakery, the business my husband and I just bought about two months ago, home. <laughs> so what has disrupted peace in my home? And how might noodling the roots of disruption lead to hope? To answer those questions, I turn to a story from our opening prayer author, Desmond Tutu. In 2008, when the former Archbishop of South Africa made a visit to Red Wing, Minnesota's Juvenile Detention Center, he was asked by a young man about the wise leader's take on black-on-black -black crime. Tutu reportedly answered after an elongated, perhaps weary pause. 
I remember taking off from Lagos Airport after a church council visit to Nigeria, he said. I was so excited to see there were two black pilots. And we, if you can hear, too, too. I grew inches. It was fantastic because we had been told in apartheid South Africa that blacks can't do this. We had a smooth takeoff, and then we hit the mother and father of turbulence. It was awful, scary. And do you know the first thought that came to my mind was, hey, there's no white men in that cockpit. Are those blacks going to be able to make it? Tutu reflected that this, for him, was an experience of black on black crime. Originating from a false narrative within, he had internalized a sense of not enoughness because of his own skin color, because of a legacy of apartheid, a kind of violence to his own being. And this violence emerging from within, this spiritual disruption, is part of the residual scar tissue of apartheid, being told for centuries that you're not fully human, not enough. As a white woman, I am deeply moved by his, this story and its implications for our universal understandings of home, our bodies, our minds, our spirits informed by our living history and our evolving present and future. And I see myself in the Archbishop's narrative, recognizing all the moments that I have been complicit in violence to my own self, my own home, my own thoughts of not being enough. I'm not patient enough to be a good mom. I'm not smart enough to run a business. I'm not humble enough to be a spiritual director. I'm not wise enough to speak aloud. I recognize the roots of violence beginning inside each of us when we forget who we are and whose we are and that we belong to each other. After all, Tutu is underscoring the systemic sin of apartheid, of a practice of separatism in our homes that underscores our spiritual unwellness, feeling separate from God and from one another. Ah. So how does this fuel hope? Hope for me, hope and home for me, emerges when I can trace the roots of this unwellness and name it. Racism and white supremacy are sins. Tutu names these things in his story. And as a white Catholic woman, I am buoyed to identify and lament racism separatism in my life. When I acknowledge these things, I experience a kind of freedom, what Dakota woman Faith Spotted Eagle has called freedom from denial. There's liberation and hope when we speak of truth and name the roots of our unwellness. In the days after Officer Geronimo Yanez fired seven bullets into the car and body of Philando Castile, killing him, I knew a violent separation inside myself and within my home community. For the first time in my four plus decades, living comfortably safe in my pink skin, unafraid of police harming me, I knew a terror that paralyzed me. I didn't want to leave the house. When I watched the Diamond Reynolds Facebook video, heard her little girl in the back seat consoling her mom, when I watched Philando take his last breaths, I saw my own brown husband dying at the hands of another fearful human being and my own child witnessing her dad's death. That little girl in the back seat, that man in the front, became Francois and Marguerite to me. And the vulnerability that created in me sparked my rage and hatred for anyone who didn't get what all of a sudden I was getting. What the sin of racism and separatism has done to us, to our common home and community. My instincts were to protect myself, my family, our daughter. 
I did not want to leave the house or allow my family to move beyond the walls of our home. I started looking at everyone, nearly everywhere, in a landscape of white supremacy. I remember the summer day at camp drop-off at Nativity, where I was trying to hide inside myself and contain all my fear and loathing, and saw another mom look at me, really look at me and ask, how are you? And that question, that intimate experience of being seen, unraveled my protective walls, though I only shrugged. I asked her in return how she was. And what became a line of division, of separation in my home community, became a crumbling wall of proximity, of hopeful encounter. I learned this woman was the wife of a police officer. Like me, she too was living from a place of fear and that experience of separatism. We hugged. I asked her her husband's name. And at our family's dinner table that night, we began to pray for their family. Dominican writer Juno Diaz speaks of something he calls the calculus of hope. I love this turn of phrase as I imagine our human mathematical equations for our salvation for our proximity and relating to one another as fully human, as hurting, as imperfect, as open, as desiring something larger than ourselves, as craving connection. I close echoing Jonkus in his song. I say, hope has a human habitation that for me comes in seeing one another as part of the body of Christ. We are one in and through love. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to your closest neighbors and share your thoughts on one or both of the following questions. What did you hear in Melissa's story? What keeps you hopeful, especially in those times of unimaginable pain? We will give you about eight to 10 minutes. Again, be sure your group is small so that all may have an opportunity to share. Please begin. <laughs> 